տատեսային մարզական միջոցառումների հետ։ And it's pretty much very situational depending on what's happening in the world whether or not Twitter gets used heavily in certain areas of the world. Եվ շատ հիրավիճակային է, այսինքն կախված աշխարհի տարբեր անկյուններում տեղի ունեցող իրադարձություններից փոխվում է Twitter-ի օգտագործման աստիճանը։ So so there's no there hasn't been that sparking event yet in the Armenian community to actually go and use Twitter Twitter to its extent. Մեկական հասարակությունում թերևս չի եղել դեռևս այնպիսի իրադարձություն, որը կբոցավառեր Twitter-ի օգտագործումը։ հարցեր այլ կան լրագրողների կողմից, որոնք այստեղ ներկայան։ Ոչ։ լավ։ Եթե Եթե չկան, կարծում եմ մենք կարող ենք արդեն սկսել դասախոսությունը, շնորակալություն, հիմա արդեն խոսապողը կպոխանց ենք ամողջովին Հավի գրիքորյանին և նա արդեն այստեղ կներկայացնի այն, ինչի համար մենք այսօր ստեղ հավակվել ենք շնորակալություն։ Կանի որ էլի շատ անում ենք, խնդրեմ նորից մի քի չա հետ նստեք, ես համոզված եմ, որ էլի տեղեր կան, համոզված եմ, խնդրում եմ, շնակալություն։ Այս շարկը, որտեղ թումոյի երի տասարդներն են նստացապ, եկ եկ փորձեն գնանք մակսիմալ վե
Ես կխնդրեմ լրություն, որտև մենք փորձում ենք արդեն սկսել շնորհակալություն։ Պլիս Ռաֆի։ Հալո։ Հայ։ Ա Thank you all for coming. I apologize I'm going to do this in as slow of English as I possibly can. Uh, my name is Rafik Rikorian. I'm, I currently am the Vice President of Platform Engineering at Twitter. Just to give you some sense of what my background is, uh, I'm a graduate of MIT. I studied computer science there. I went to the MIT Media Lab to work on some fairly crazy projects for a while. I, I worked on making new generation buildings. I worked on building computer chips to do the internet. Uh, after, after the Media Lab, I started my own consulting company for a while. I also started a startup to try to help the world understand how much energy they were using. I'm very interested in trying to solve one of the world's biggest problems, which is the amount of energy we're using in global warming. Uh, but somehow I ended up in San Francisco. It turns out my wife wanted to go to school in San Francisco. So I took a job at Twitter where I started off as an engineer on the API team. So what I used to do for the beginning of my career at Twitter, that was about four and a half years ago, I used to write Ruby code, for those of you who know what that is. I used to spend all my day, something like 12 hours a day, just making the Ruby code on our servers work really quickly. Uh, so if you use Twitter today, how many people use Twitter? Okay, more of you should use Twitter. We can talk about that later. Um, so, if you use Twitter today from your cell phone, for example, whenever you tweet, whenever you retweet, whenever you load your timeline, it makes a call to our Twitter servers, and I used to write that code. That, so you can either blame me or thank me for a lot of that code that's on those servers. Um, and since then, uh, I've been in charge of more and more parts of the back end of Twitter. So, right now, I run a team that we call Platform engineering. So what platform engineering does is we make Twitter work for the world. I don't know anything about how to make Twitter pretty. I don't know anything about how to make Twitter work on a phone, for example. What I do is put computers everywhere, everywhere on the planet and put my team's software on those computers so we can make Twitter really fast and really efficient and make sure that Twitter is always on and running. If, if you guys used to use Twitter a few years ago, then you might remember the fail well, which showed up almost every day. It was my team's job to get rid of that fail well. So our job is basically to give the world the Twitter we think it deserves, which means that Twitter is always up and running. So these days, I don't write code anymore, which makes me really sad. But what I do instead is I run a team of about 350 people. And so we work on all the software that makes the back end of Twitter work. So what I wanted to do today was talk about what it's like to work on my team. What are the kind of things we do every day? What are the things I think about when I run a team of 350 people who are trying to program Twitter? Um, if you want to ask me technical questions, I can try to answer them for you. I, I am one of the architects of how the system works today. Um, but I was going to focus most of my time on how the team operates and all the things that I talk to my team about and how I think about running my team. So these days, I work more of like a um, general manager than anything else. So I, the way I like to think about it is that I have, again, 350 people. I have a set of people who work directly for me, and they're coaches to the rest of my group. Their job is to make my group function and do everything it needs to get done on a day-by-day -day basis. And my job is to set it up so that we have the conditions for success for Twitter itself. So the goal for Twitter 
in general is to make it one of the world's best places for engineers to work. So Twitter does this in many different ways. If you're ever in San Francisco, you should look me up and I'll bring you by the Twitter office. Um, we have free lunch, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, we will do your laundry for you. Uh, you, can, like, you can schedule a massage in one of the rooms. I, I'm not joking, like there's a yoga class every single day. There's a weightlifting gym if you wanna go work out. Um, so we take really good care of our people. And that's what Twitter is trying to do overall. What I view my job to be is to make it possible for people to do the best work of their lives. So this phrase is one that I learned when I was an engineer which from a, a, a person I call my mentor for when it comes to managing. And my job as the vice president of this group, of this 350 people, a third of engineering at Twitter, is I want to make it possible for them to do the best work of their lives. I want to make it possible for them to be passionate about what they're doing, for them to learn new things, for them to basically want to take their work home with them if they, if they chose to. Uh, how do I know this works? Right now I know it works because I actually have the world's most lenient work from home policy and the world's most lenient vacation policy in that I don't care if you come to the office every day. Um, you know, if you have a meeting scheduled with me, maybe you should show up. But besides that, I don't care if you show up to the office every day. And I don't track how much vacation you take. So take as much vacation as you want. Take it whenever you want. Maybe don't take it when the World Cup is happening in case Twitter gets really popular and we need to do something. But besides that, I don't really track this type of stuff. But my guys show up to work every day. The only time they don't show up to work is like when, when their child is sick or when they're sick or when they have a doctor's appointment or stuff like that. Almost everyone actually comes to the office every single day. And in fact, I've been known to have to put on the screen at meetings like this when I'm in front of my team who hasn't taken a vacation recently so I can tell them to go take a vacation. So I think it's working. So I just want to talk about what it means to, what, what I do in order to make that happen. So there are really three things that we're going to talk about today very briefly. And they sort of break down as what are the things that are basically you have to measure everything in order for it to be working. Uh, secondly, how to invest in the people on my team. And thirdly, what it means for me to have education happen at Twitter. So we'll go through them one by one. So a phrase that I like to throw around a lot at Twitter is you can't manage what you can't measure. And this means a lot of different things. It means both technically and it means people-wise. And I'll go through them both, uh, I'll go through both of them. So what I mean by you can't manage what you can't measure is I have this interesting example for you. So this is my bathroom scale. <laughs> Uh, my bathroom scale, I get on it every single day. If, you've, if you know what this particular model is, I'm not sure you all do. This bathroom scale actually sends my weight to a web server every single day and gives me a graph of what my weight looks like. And then once a week from a Twitter account, which I won't tell you what it is, it tweets what my weight is. Um, so basically, the world can see how much I weigh right now and I can use that as a way for me to manage how much I weigh. So basically what it ends up looking like, and I'll just sort of do it in front of all of you, is this is what my weight has looked like since 2009. Uh, you can see I have a minor problem right now. Um, and so this is a lot of different things that sort of come into play. So I started working at Twitter in, t in the beginning of 2009. I kind of gained a lot of weight. Uh, as, I w as I started working through Twitter, I must gain something like, uh, you know, 12 pounds almost. Uh, then I decided to take up running for a while. Then I kind of gave up running for a while uh, and sort of all just gone to hell from there. So what, it basically, what I'm basically trying to demonstrate is like I can put a graph like this in front of me every morning and I can know I, have, I need to do something about my weight all of a sudden. Like I sort of let it go out of control. And this exact same thing applies to both the kind of software that Twitter writes and to my team. What I mean by software, well, I'll show you this in a few minutes, 
is I know exactly how well all my computers are doing around the world. So at the bare minimum, you know, I have thousands of computers somewhere around the world, and something like three computers a day are dying on me. So I know which ones are dying, and I can know I can fix them. Or I even know whether or not something's about to die, because I see it slowing down, or I see it sort of acting a little weird. And for my people and for my organization, I also track things like this. I track uh, like how fast is code being written every single day? How fast are reviews being given? And by reviews, I mean every single time someone writes code at Twitter, someone else needs to read it first before it can go and be launched to the world. So how fast does that actually happen? There are all these different pulse points I like to take on my organization to make sure it's functioning healthily and we know what's going on. And so I really think everyone should apply this to almost every single part of your life. If there's something you actually want to, actually want to manage and control, you need to be actively measuring it. And obviously, we're all really busy. Like this is, a, this is a shot of what my office looks like in any given day. Like we're all crammed in, people are running around. If something goes wrong inside one of our computers, there are sirens that go off, so we have to go take a look at it. So it's really easy for us to forget that we have to go measure stuff. It's really easy to just like qualitatively take a look at things. So it'll just be like, you know, either for me, like my weight's kind of under control, I don't have to worry about it or the system is functioning normally, we probably don't have to worry about it today. Those are all traps. Like you should never fall into that kind of trap. For everyone, if there's something you really care about, you should be watching it really closely over time and making sure you're getting the outcomes that you want to get out of them. This is a lesson we had to learn at Twitter because it's not something that was part of our DNA when we started. So we actually needed to go and start retrofitting all our systems so we can start measuring them. So measurement means a bunch of different things. Measurement both means knowing like, what the raw number is, but also having a visceral understanding of what you are trying to take a look at. So here's one number I care about a lot at Twitter. So about every single day, there are about 500 million tweets that go through the system. Uh, if this number ever goes down, I know something went wrong, because the number almost never goes down. In fact, it goes up every single day. What I care about is not just whether you have 500 million tweets going in. What I care about is much more fine-grained than that. I care about how many tweets are coming in right now, because I don't care if it's the end of the day and we didn't count 500 million tweets. I care right now if we're not tracking toward 500 million tweets. One way to look at that is basically to try to divide that number down a bit. So instead of 500 million tweets, what like, we could think about, do we have 5,800 tweets every single second go through the system? And this is kind of what we call steady state at Twitter. At any given time, about 5,800 people around the world, every single second of every single day, are sending some information through Twitter. And my job is to sort of pump that through the system. But again, I think this is also a false way to look at it, in the sense that if I were to look at, say, my heart, my heart beats something like 85,000 times a day. And so again, it's not really important whether or not at the end of the day it beat, it beated, beated? I'm not sure how to conjugate that. 85,000 times. What I really care about is it beating right now. And so the same thing applies to all the kind of metrics that you look at. So you need to find that right kind of granularity in the system so you can be monitoring on a day-by-day -day basis. So if we do that to tweets, for example, this is what my heart rate looks like. This is my heartbeat, effectively. If you watch TV, if you watch any medical show, you see this on the screen all the time. This is subdivided to heartbeats, effectively. Twitter does basically the same thing. So I told you it's about 5,800 tweets every single second going through the system. I kind of lied. What it really looks like is something like this. So between those two lines, this is 24 hours. That first peak up there on the right, on your left, that was my right, is around 8 o'clock in the morning Pacific time, so 8 o'clock in the morning in San Francisco, California. That's what we call on peak at Twitter. 8 o'clock in the morning, San Francisco time at Twitter, 
is basically when everyone on the West Coast, that's sort of San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, are going to work, and they're all tweeting about either they're going to work, they hate their jobs, they don't want to be going to work, or stuff like that. 8 a.m. San Francisco time is around lunchtime in New York, so they're all tweeting about leaving for lunch. New York is in the same time zone as Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Brazil is massive on Twitter these days. It's about to become bigger. The World Cup is in, Twitter, in Brazil this year. So they're compounding the effects. It's around what I call beer o'clock in London. Uh, so they're all after work drunk tweeting, effectively. And then it's around midnight in Tokyo, so they're all tweeting good night, literally good night. If you look at Japanese tweets around this time of day, the amount of tweets that say good night is a little crazy. And so you can see the heartbeat of Twitter. This is the normal pattern that I see every single day in the Twitter system. Uh, it goes down a bit after that because the sun sort of zooms over the Pacific, and no one really lives in the Pacific except for Hawaii. No one really lives in Hawaii. And then it picks up again as it goes over Hong Kong, Japan, Indonesia, New Zealand, Australia, and things like that. And the day starts again when it goes around. If the system ever did something that didn't look like this, it either means that we broke something, or it means that there is an event going on in the world, and we're seeing abnormally large traffic through the system. I'll show you some examples of those later. So this is what I mean by the fact that you actually need to figure out the right granularity when you want to measure. That line is about 5,800 tweets a second. So we spend half the day at over that and half the day at under that. And we just need to understand that as we watch the system. So for the computer nerds in the audience, this is basically what my dashboard on Twitter looks like. I have a really big screen next to my desk, and this is what's on that screen every single day. I've taken away some of the numbers, so you can't see all the numbers that are on the screen. Like, if you look, the, the y-axis doesn't have any data on it because I'd get fired if I showed it to you. Uh, so, but this is basically the kind of information I look at every single day. Every second of the day I'm at my desk, this is in my face, and it's in my team's face, because we're monitoring the health of Twitter overall. I said before it's really important to make this as easy as possible, and we've made it as easy as we think we can. Again, for the engineers in the crowd, it literally only takes two lines of code in order to measure something at Twitter. So you put those two lines of code around whatever you care about, and graphs start appearing all over the office. So we can just measure anything we want as cheaply as we want, and we don't care about it. So then the challenge really becomes, although I'm not worried about this too much, are we measuring too many things? But it turns out if you have smart engineers, they filter that down, and you don't have to worry about it too much. So we do this for literally everything. I know exactly how long every single API request from Armenia takes, when it hits my data center. I know exactly how, long, how large every single API response is. I know the health of the system. I know everything I want to know about the system in real time. And this is one of the ways that we measure our system. But we do the same thing for all the, the people at my, at my team. So like I was mentioning before, I track things like how much code is everybody writing? How long does it take for that code to go into production? So I can know whether or not Either A, I have some people who are slacking off, but that's usually not the case. What it usually tells me, if I see that the amount of code we're writing has gone down, is we, we've made the system too hard all of a sudden. I have some of the best engineers in the world, but they may accidentally make the system hard to write software in all of a sudden. Like they've either made a mistake or they made a bad call, and all the teams are sort of paying for it. So I watch those type of things across my entire organization. I watch, we do what we call um, feedback reviews every few months at Twitter. So we know how, we basically say how well we think each other is doing. And we watch that and carefully as well, because we want to know whether or not we as a group think we're getting better or we think we're getting worse. So I have graphs of those all over my desk in the office as well. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll move on to the second thing. Teams are atomic unit and building block. What I mean by that 
is I actually don't look at a, on a person by person basis across platform engineering. One, 350 people is too large. Two, I'm friends with half the people on my team. Like I've either personally hired them or I've worked with them for years. So what I really want to do instead is incentivize people to work together. I don't want to incentivize people to work alone. When you work alone, you make mistakes and no one else knows about them. Or I like to use the example, I'll tell it both in a negative and a positive way, of what we call a hit by the bus scenario, which is what you've written some code, you've launched some code in a production, and all of a sudden you get hit by a bus on the way home, and no one knows how the code works because you're dead. Uh, that would suck. Uh, we can say more positively, we can say something like the win the lottery scenario. So you write some code, you win the lottery, and then you're like, I hate you, Rafi, and you quit, and therefore we still don't know what code you've written. So we need to protect against both of those. So starting with the technology, we built a system at Twitter when I first joined that we called Snowflake. So what Snowflake did was it was our way of of uniquely naming every single ID, uh, naming every single tweet in the system. Every single tweet has a unique ID, hence the, sense, hence the name Snowflake. We wanted to do this in as distributed as a manner as possible. And what I meant by that is we don't want everyone to have to ask a single computer, what's the next ID we should give a tweet? We want to be able to ask any computer in a data center, give me an ID for the tweet. This way we're not sort of bottlenecked on one single computer in the data center. So I try to do the same thing with all my teams at Twitter, in that every single team is designed to run as fast as they can and as individually as they can without having to coordinate with each other. So when I first joined Twitter, again for the computer nerds in the audience, this is kind of what our system looked like. So we had one piece of code, we jokingly called it the monorail, um, and then we had one huge database on the back end. We had so many problems with this system. When you had 30 engineers, 40 engineers, 50 engineers, we were all stepping on each other's toes, and we were all trying to make decisions for each other without knowing exactly what was going on. Basically, we were all trying to be the boss of this, of this box over here. So 30 really smart men, sadly all men, there were no women at the time, at Twitter, uh, uh, 30 smart engineers, we were all sort of trying to make decisions for what, what we should do with this piece of code, and we'd all be conflicting with each other. So if I decide to write some code at two o'clock in the morning, I might make a decision that someone else may not have made, and that five o'clock in the morning is just like, what did you do? And he sort of unwinds it, and then we sort of fight about it, and stuff like that. So this really didn't work for us, at, uh, at all. And what we ended up evolving the system into is something that looks more like this. It looks a little bit like spaghetti, don't worry about that. But basically, we now have hundreds of different pieces of code in the server at any given time. Hundreds of teams can be working at Twitter and they won't be stepping on each other's toes anymore. I can have one team that works on direct messages I have another team that works on timelines. I have another team that works on tweets. And they don't conflict with each other because they can each own their own destiny. They can all work as quickly as they can independently of each other. When we were in that single code base world, true story, someone translated the website into Japanese. The Japanese translation was fine, but there was a bug in their code and all of Twitter fell over minutes later. These days, if someone has a bug in a Japanese translation, then just a website goes down. Our mobile clients still stay up, the entire backend still stays up, and in fact, just one section of the data center may have problems. So what we've been really trying to do is what we call isolate the concerns of Twitter into every single individual team. So no one team could do damage to the entire, to the entire company, to the entire code base, but more positively, it meant that every single team can now be fully independent from each other. Each one of these teams can make a decision on their own and not have to talk to anybody else when they're working on code. They can just launch it as much as they want. In fact, in that old system, when we only had one big piece of code that we called the monorail, we launched new features at most once a day. Today, in a system that looks like this, we launch features 50 times a day. 
because each one of these teams can push new software into production as fast as they want, anytime they want, and not have to worry about talking to anyone else when they do it. I like to call this, for better or for worse, the splinter model, splinter team model of, um, of, of teams. I want splinter cells and not top-down control. I don't want to run it like an army where I'm the single general that sort of commands all the troops. What I really want is for every single one of those teams to make local choices and not talk to me. Because one, I'm lazy, I don't want to talk to them. But two, they fundamentally know more about their problem than I do. While I run this team, and while I may have built a lot of the system myself, I don't know what it does today. It may have been months since I've looked at their code. It may have been years since I've looked at their code. I want to have teams of experts who can make decisions on their own and not talk to me at all. I just want to say big statements, like we're going to make direct messages better, and we're going to, fundament we're going to add pictures to direct messages. And then teams can figure out what they need to do. They don't need to coordinate with me. They don't need to coordinate with each other. And in fact, I can just be surprised one day when it just sort of works. I'm like, oh, you've been working on it for weeks now. That's great. And look, it's in production. That's generally what I'm trying to do. Local decisions by independent teams that can be self-directed and self-thinking. In fact, these teams run themselves like their own company in that I give them a small amount of budget, which is basically how many people can you hire. And that's it. They can use whatever tools they want. They run their teams any way they want. They have to make, they basically have to show up and tell me maybe once a week what they've been up to for the last week, but that's it. I want them to run as independently as they can. So the kinds of people that I'm trying to hire into Twitter are kinds of people that are not to, actually don't want to take orders every day. I want to take people into Twitter that passionately want to make the product better and will just do it themselves without very much direction from me or from anyone else. In fact, they're holding themselves accountable for making Twitter better. Because if they don't make Twitter better, then I'll then ask them, what have you been doing for the past few months if you haven't been making Twitter better? But I don't want to have to tell them how to do it because again, they probably know more than I do right now. So another thing I like to do is I like to create long-lived teams at Twitter. So I have a team of, say, five people. Sorry. I have a team of, say, five people large, and they can work on different projects all the time. In fact, what the common, the common trap for people who run teams like mine is to do is basically put all their people in a spreadsheet and assign them. It's like, we need to, make, we need to add photos to DM. We're going to take Josh, we're going to take Adam, we're going to take et cetera, et cetera, and we're going to make a new team. What i rather do instead is, sorry, what i rather do instead is figure out what's the team that's working on the least important thing right now and give them a new project to do. Why do I do that? Why don't I just re recreate teams? So the analogy I like to use is, one, I don't know very much about sports, but the analogy I like to use is I don't want to change my soccer team or my football team between every single game. You want that team to work together, know how to play together, so that whenever they face a new opponent, they already know how to coordinate themselves against that new opponent. So I want to do the exact same thing with software teams. I want those teams to be exactly the same people. I want that team to be a group of people that has dinner together. I want that team to be a group of people that goes to the movie together. I want that team to be a group of people that goes to drinks together. So they know how to work with each other. They've built things before together. They have successes under their belt. And I can just give them a new project to go work on all of a sudden. And they'll go kick ass at it, sorry. They'll go and really um, do a really good job at that one project. And I can just sort of change it on them all the time. There are stages that teams go through. So the four stages that teams go through are sort of the forming, storming, norming, and performing stages. What this basically means is that if I were to put, say, five of you together and say you're going to go work on this project, the first thing you're going to go do is be like, who are you? Where'd you come from? What's your schedule like? What do you like to eat? Well, how do you like to sit? Stuff like that. They're going to have to get some social stuff out of the way. Then they're going to go figure out what is this problem we're trying to solve. 
then they have to actually go and try to solve that problem and hopefully they're going to do excellent at it, do really well at it. I want to try to cut out that whole social part. Not that I don't like people meeting each other, but it's just a waste of time. I want people to already know how to work with each other and just do it over and over and over again as quickly as they can and not worry about it. And my theory is that when you work with a team that you've worked with before, you're going to get better and better and better at working as a team. In fact, I think you'll do unimaginably well if you know intimately how everyone on your team operates and functions. You want to turn it off? Hello, great. So you're going to do intimately well if you know how the team functions and you can sort of work with each other on it. So this is my team. These are one of my Sorry. Cool. Going back to the previous thing, I give these control over what to do. In fact, they are allowed to hire independently of everyone else. They run their own hiring processes. They run their own feedback processes. They run their own code deployment. They don't, all my teams work as independently as they possibly can. And I think that's so important because it makes them passionate about the types of problems they have to solve. If they need a certain type of expert on the team, they will go find that expert and go hire that expert and not talk to me about it. Uh, in fact, when I have to step in and sort of make sure they're hiring the right person, I consider that team as struggling and I need to go help that team figure out how to be independent. Tattoo that I buy for every team basically when they start is every day I'm hustling. So I literally buy this tattoo for every single team whenever I create it. And the goal here is to remind them that it's their job to hustle. It's their job to go figure out exactly what they need to do today. It's their job to try to do better than the team next to them. So they are trying to run as fast as they possibly can. The only time I expect them to stop running is if they hit a roadblock. If two teams are conflicting and two teams want to do the same thing at the same time, then instead of fighting over it, I prefer they come talk to me and I'll make a call of which team should go forward. But besides that, I basically measure and constantly monitor how often I don't get involved in conflict. And that's one of my goals as running this group. Continuously invest in general. One of the things run, one of the things is called Twitter University. So what Twitter University does is it constantly is retraining my engineers to learn something new. Remember before I said my job is to make sure people are working on the things that they are the most passionate about. That thing might change. It might change once a year. There are databases. OK, we'll try this again. This year, I might be really interested in working on databases. Next year, I might want to be an Android programmer. So what Twitter University does is that we run classes within Twitter. So again, I have 350 people who work for me. And this is basically the portal, our internal portal of all the different classes that we're offering at Twitter right now. In fact, this is only page one. <laughs> it keeps on going. And we record every single class so people can watch it on their own time. If I, want, if I have someone who wants to learn how to program Python, we have a class for Python. And we'll teach them how to program in Python. If you want to learn how to program an Android phone, we have a class for Android. And we'll teach you how to program Android. So again, the goal is for you to be working on whatever you find the most interesting. And even if you don't know how to do it, I will teach you how to do it. I want to be hiring people who are capable of learning. I don't want to hire people who are experts in Java. I don't want to hire people who are experts in C++. I don't want to hire JavaScript experts. I want to hire really smart people who are really excited to learn things. 
and that way I can teach them whatever we need to tackle. The world is changing so quickly, especially in computers, that I can't predict what I'm going to need tomorrow. So I want to have people who will see a new challenge in front of them, be excited about that new challenge, and then go to my university guys and ask them, teach me how to go and try to tackle this problem. And they'll go and try to figure it out from there. Another thing I like to do on my team is a program we call Branching Out. Whoops. It's a, it's a program that we call Branching Out. And what I mean by that, if it goes on the screen, does it stay? Well, pretend it stayed. What I mean by that is anyone can choose to leave a team at any point they want. So if they want to join a new team, there is nothing that holds them to that team, except I might ask them, like, have you really finished all your work here before you leave, leave that team in a lurch? So basically what I'm trying to do with all my guys and girls is, is give them an, an environment where they can choose their own destiny within Twitter. So if they want to join a new team and they need to learn something new to do it, I will help them make that happen. I will never ask someone to do something they don't want to do unless it's actually important for the company that we go take care of it right now. So for example, the World Cup is coming up. It's a very big time for Twitter. If someone asked me to change teams right now, I'd be a little more nervous. I'd say, can you wait until after the World Cup and then we'll do it? But my promise to anyone who joins my team is that they can change whatever they're working on at almost any time they want to. So this way I can make sure I have a really engaged team. How do I know it works? I have only had about five people quit on me in the last two years at Twitter. And it's because I'm letting them try all these different things. I really believe what smart engineers want is an opportunity to learn new things, an opportunity to get really good at things, and an opportunity to make a difference on the teams. So if they don't think they're making a difference on the team they're working on, they should move to another team and make a difference on that team instead. So what this means is failure is actually an option within platform engineering. I prefer the site doesn't go down. Uh, so what I mean by this is that we actually allow everyone to run experiments at Twitter all the time. In fact, everyone at Twitter is allowed to run what we call a 1% experiment. So if you wanted to launch a new feature, you don't need my permission as the VP to launch that feature to users in the world. Just please don't do something illegal. Please don't do something that looks ugly and stuff like that. But launch a new feature in the world, you can do it up to 1% of the user base. Launch it for a week, get some data, turn it off, and then let's talk about whether it should go to 100%. So in that world, Failure is an option. You can launch an experiment at Twitter that our users hate. That's why I let you only do it to 1%. Or what we, what we sometimes do is we launch it to like a different country. Uh, I'll, I can choose a country, but then you'll all tweet about it, so I won't tell you which country. But So we can launch features to different countries, to different demographics, to different percentages, and just try things out. And if it fails, it fails. If it doesn't fail, awesome. Let's figure out how to go up to 100%. An example of one of them is if you're a Twitter user, I recommend you follow this account, which is called Magic Rex. Magic Rex started as an experiment, and it basically sends you an, a direct message whenever something interesting is happening on Twitter that you might be interested about. So it, Magic Rex learns everything about you because he knows who you're following and stuff like that, and it'll push you recommendations of other people to follow, or when there's some breaking news happens, it pushes you a recommendation of that. This was a 1% experiment. Some guy on my team decided they just wanted to write this and see if it works. Turns out it works really well. So then this one went to 100% pretty fast after we launched it. Another thing we do, uh, sorry. Another thing that we do that sort of allows that kind of creative release is we run, a pro we run twice a year for one week, something we call Hack Week. So at Hack Week at Twitter, we shut down all of Twitter engineering. So no one's actually working on Twitter, per se. No one's actually working on the website. The website's running, obviously. And what we let engineers do is gather a new team together, people they've never worked with before, try something new, 
and go try to build a new feature. And then at the end of that week, we have a science fair where we demo all these features to each other and we see which ones we like best. We really give engineers that kind of creative outlet to try something again, try something new or learn something new again. I've seen some of my backend engineers use this opportunity to learn how to program an iPhone and they'll go build a new iPhone feature for us. And in fact, some features have launched into production. I'll put a quick video on the screen. If you use Twitter, you might know that blue line that shows up whenever a conversation starts at Twitter, that was a Hack Week project. Some of the guys showed up at my door and they're like, it's really hard to follow a conversation at Twitter. And I said, yes, it probably is. So they went and built the blue line and we launched that into production at full scale only a couple of months ago. So again, I want engineers, I want to build an environment so engineers can feel free to make these kind of changes because I'm give, empowering them to make those kind of changes on the site. Generally what this comes down to is I want people who join my team to control their own destiny. I don't want them to look at me and say, what's next for my career? I want to ask them instead, what do you want your career to be? And then I will figure out how to make sure you have the resources to do that. I want self-directed people working on platform engineering who say that I think I want to learn mobile development. I want to learn backend development. I really want to get good at assembler or stuff like that. I'm like, great, we will find you a team that you can learn that type of stuff on because you're in charge of your own career. In fact, when you come up for promotion at Twitter, it's because you say, I think I'm ready to be promoted. And then you go through the evaluation process and then your peers decide if you're actually ready to be promoted. But you have to say, I think I'm ready. And that's the most important thing, that we really want our engineers to take control over their own destiny when they join platform engineering. So these are the three things that I like to think about every single day when I run platform, is what do we need to measure today that we've never measured before? How can I better invest in teams? And an example of that is I don't give bonuses to people. I give bonuses to teams. So if one person on a team is kicking butt, it doesn't really matter to me. The entire team is getting a bonus. So the team also holds itself accountable for if someone is slacking off because they're either going to try to get that guy fired or they're going to try to make sure that guy is performing so the team can get a bonus moving forward. And then finally, I really believe in continuing education uh, on Twitter so that people can really tackle problems they've never learned to tackle before. So like I said, my goal is to make it possible for people to do the best work of their lives. And the reason why this is important is because of things like this. So this is when the plane went down into Hudson River in New York City. It took the New York Times three hours to write an article about it. I coincidentally was in the New York Times building that day and we could see the plane in the river and it took them hours to write about it. Whereas the first piece of breaking news was some guy who sent a tweet when he was on a boat that was being diverted to go pick up the passengers from the water. When the first man who walked on the, new, the moon died, the entire world mourned together on Twitter especially. And then when earthquakes or bad calamities occur in the world, this is the USGS, the place that records, the US Bureau that records all earthquake information. When the Japanese earthquake occurred, you could see the conversation on Twitter change. So Japan is over there, you can lightly see what the tweet stream looks like, and you'll see in a second when the earthquake hit. This is a real-time visualization of it. And that was the earthquake. So you can see that the world starts talking immediately when things happen on Twitter. 
So the reason why it's important for me to have a team that's really passionate about what it's doing is because what I say is we owe it to the world to give them a Twitter that is performant, that is responsive, and is always there for them. Because I want them to be able to use Twitter, like say when the World Cup is coming up, I want them to use Twitter to celebrate whenever there's a shot on goal or whenever there's a red card. I want that, I want that signal to be pumped through Twitter. This is basically 2010 on the World Cup at Twitter. You can't see it as well, but in the back, every single one of those spikes in the back is literally a shot on goal, a red card, or a call by the ref. And you can see what happens in the world in the system. And so my team's responsibility, or my team's opportunity, is to give the world the Twitter it deserves. And that's why I want to really make sure I make the environment that I have people working on the problems they're the most passionate about, because we have to make this work for the world. So one last thing I want to just note while I have all you here, is since I believe so much in education as part of, as part of what we do at Twitter, and like I talked a lot about how we do Android retraining, I want to mention that we're going to be starting the Yerevan Code Jam program. And the first one we're going to do is we're going to try to teach anyone who's interested how to program an Android phone this summer. So we'll be running a program for about three months this summer with the goal of people who've never learned, never was able to program Android before, to come out of it having programmed an application on a mobile phone. I really think, like Twitter sees this every day, the majority of our traffic is not from our website. The majority of our traffic is from mobile devices. Outside the United States, the majority of mobile devices are Android phones. I really think this is the future, and this is something very similar to what we did inside Twitter. In fact, the curriculum from this class is written by the guy who literally wrote the curriculum for Twitter. So we'll be running this class in the summer. If you guys are interested, you should go to this website and sort of sign up with your interest, and we'll get back to you when we have more details about exactly when we're starting. So with that, thank you for showing up. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you want to follow me, just go there. Um, thanks. I guess I'll take questions if someone wants to ask questions. Hi, thanks Rafi. It was a, a really inspirational speech. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, my question is about uh, Twitter's policy on privacy and uh, how that affects you managing a crew of 300 plus engineers and its relationship post uh, Edward Snowden uh, NSA world and how that affects what work you do. So the question is basically, how, what do we think about privacy within Twitter engineering, especially when I have a team this large? It, I mean, that's a great question. So one, Twitter is actually really designed not to have any private data. And that's actually by design. Like, you, everything you said that is said on Twitter, except for your direct messages, are open for the entire world to see. So we've eliminated a whole class of threats just by doing that. I don't have to worry about the privacy of the tweets themselves. What I do have to worry about, what I do have to worry about is things like I know the IP addresses people come from and stuff like that. So we've invested a lot of time in building systems that make sure that even I don't have access to the IP addresses any of you are coming from when you talk to Twitter. Like for me to get access to it, I actually need to get another engineer to sign off on it and then we can both see it. I, no one person can get access to that type of information. And it's because I also do have, like I have President Barack Obama's phone number somewhere in my system. I have Lady Gaga's phone number or Katy Perry's phone number. I have all these people's phone numbers somewhere inside our databases. So no one person can get to it. You're going to need another person to sign off on it. And that's protected in the system itself. Hi, thanks for the uh, presentation. Um, I'm Rafi as well. Um, one of the questions that um, a friend asked me to ask is when and if there will be a change 
in the 140 characters? <laughs> uh, hi, Rafi. It turns out I don't actually bump into that many Rafis in the States, but that's the problem. Uh, yeah, I come to Armenia more often, exactly. Um, so will we ever change from 140 characters? Maybe. I mean, I, I can't predict the future. However, I can tell you why 140 characters is important to us. So in places like Armenia and places like most Western world countries, we actually all have fairly decent cell phones. Uh, but if you're in places like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, you're in places like in India, you're in places like the Philippines that don't have good penetration of smartphones, they rely on SMS in order to use Twitter. 140 characters means that they can use SMS to get into the system. And I actually think that's incredibly important. My wife does a lot of healthcare work in India as part of her research. She does mostly education now. She used to do healthcare. And they used to use Twitter to tweet whenever there was uh, disease outbreaks in certain cities. And what Twitter did in that situation is we worked deals with the carriers so that SMSs via Twitter were free to be received. So that anyone could receive tweets for free and then healthcare places could use SMS to distribute that information far and broadly. So until the entire world has smartphones, I kind of predict we'll probably stick with the 140 characters. Don't hold me to that. I'm not the product guy. I'm just an engineer. But that's generally how we think about 140. Um, hi. Um, I have a question regarding the trends and um, most importantly, trends for Armenia. Yeah. Are we going to get them anytime soon? Uh, so the question is the trending topics. We do it by countries now. Armenia is not currently one of those countries. Um, and it turns out, I didn't actually realize this, and this trip to Yerevan has been useful for me, I didn't realize hashtags didn't work in Armenian. Um, I literally emailed the engineer in charge of hashtags yesterday and said, what's up? Um, so I expect they'll be talking to me on Monday when I show up back at office again. That's a prerequisite in order to do anything. I can't guarantee that we'll turn on trends for Armenia after that, but at least getting hashtags seems like a good first step. Uh, Rafi, if you compare Twitter to the um, uh, IM internet-based uh, messaging applications that are spreading fast on mobile phones, uh, can you take a minute and either give a comparison or direction because they, they seem to kind of have some overlap but no overlap. Uh, it so would the question be good to is hear like your comparing, thoughts. comparing Twitter to something like Snapchat or WeChat or stuff like that, basically what people are using for person-to-person -person communication. The really important thing about Twitter is it's public and it's real time. So it's not that I'm going to have a one-to-one -one conversation with the United States president. It's not like I'm going to have a one-to-one -one conversation with a celebrity. But I can go listen to what a celebrity is saying or the president is saying. I can listen to what's happening in the World Cup. In fact, I get most of my news from breaking news sources that are publishing on Twitter these days. So that use case is fundamentally different than a person-to-person -person instant messaging case. Twitter has direct messages in the background, but again, that's not really the thing that we spend most of our time thinking about. We're much more interested in the public, real-time, and conversational space. Right now, we're the only platform in the world that does it. Um, so we're in a very fortunate, very fortunate position of both not having any competition, but two, sort of having the burden on us to make sure it's possible for the world to use it. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. If you don't mind, changing the topic a little. Tell us, could you tell us some more about your Armenian background, where your parents are from, if you grew up in Armenian circles, or what you think about this country, and please use more than 140 characters. Yeah, I can, I'll, I can talk about that briefly. I mean, my, my father is Armenian from Beirut. He moved to the States around 1969, give or take, if I remember the dates correctly. Uh, my first language is actually Armenian, which is quite sad in retrospect since I don't speak it fluently anymore. I understand it, and the, like, I think the, the people at TUMO find it entertaining because they'll talk, uh, then they'll have to be translated, and I'll be like, that's not exactly what you said. Uh, so that sort of happens here and there. Um, 
But so my mother is actually not Armenian. My mother, though, learned Armenian, which has allowed me to be allowed it to be my first language, uh, because my grandparents lived with us when we were when I was growing up in New York. So my mother had to learn to speak with them. My mother is actually from the Philippines. My father and mother met in New York City, uh, as a lot of crazy connections happen. Uh, and my sister and I, again, our first language is Armenian until the, my parents threw us into American public school, and I had to learn English very quickly, otherwise I'll be beat up. So I learned English very quickly after that, and then sadly I so slowly lost my Armenian. My parents sent us to Armenian school every Friday, um, which mostly worked. It got a little weird when my aunt was my teacher, because then you kind of don't want to do what your aunt says, so that sort of didn't bode well for me. Um, and then it completely went downhill, sadly, when I went off to university, and I wasn't living at home, I wasn't hearing it every day. Um, it's something I actually wonder a lot with my child. I have an 11-month-old son, 11 son at home, so I'm trying to figure out exactly how we're going to make sure that he has um, at least a shot of speaking Armenian in the way that I don't right now. Hello. Uh, I want to ask about uh, the coding practices. You have talked about the problems which uh, when one developer could break the code. Uh, have you any code review practices? And please tell a bit more about the process uh, of deploying the developed code. So I can, I can nerd out for a couple of minutes. Um, so whenever someone writes code at Twitter, you are not, in fact, the system prevents you from sending that code into production until someone else has checked off on it. And what my expectation is that when you, when you write code and someone else says it's good to go, if that code doesn't work in production, I will blame both of you. I don't just blame the person who wrote it, I also blame the person who reviewed it. So another thing that engineers at Twitter sometimes do is pair programming, where literally we'll connect two keyboard, literally connect two keyboards to one computer, and they'll both be writing the code simultaneously with each other. So that's one way to short circuit the pair programming process. Um, and then when we roll code out to production, one, you, all the tests have to pass before you can roll it to production, but two, um, we roll code slowly through the cluster. So there are tens of thousands of computers that power Twitter these days. Um, so we roll it to 1%, we see how it does. We roll it to 10% of the cluster, we see how it does. And if that's still going well, then we'll big bang it all the way to 100%. But it gives us all these opportunities for us to be, to be like, oh, whoa, that didn't work. And we can pull it back before we go too far. Um, so that's generally how we do it. And I'm happy afterwards to talk even more detail if you want. A lot of our Twitter believes heavily in open source, so a lot of the tools we use are just on our GitHub page, and you can just use the exact same tools we use if you wanted to. Hello. Um, you've talked a lot about how you value education at your company, and I'm sure we all agree education is key. I mean, that's why we're at the center. Um, but do you not think that Twitter could perhaps use their powers of being connected to hundreds of millions of people to kind of promote education, to run programs of education, like you've done with the Yerevan Code Jam? So what Twitter does in the States, and, and we're guilty of not doing this more broadly, but we're, I would say we're only a six-year-old company at this point, is we invest into two different things. One is we actually do a lot of co-teaching in universities around the Twitter offices. So I've been known to lecture at uh, University of California at Berkeley. I've been known to lecture at Stanford because I sort of, I'm trying to help uh, students get the practical knowledge that companies like Twitter are really interested in. Second, and we're, we are taking a very different tact on this, we're investing into engineering education for teenage girls in the United States. So what we do there is we actually sponsor very directly programs that teach teenage girls how to write software. And we're doing that because we think that, one, the world would be a better place if we just have more engineers in the world. Um, and boys don't have a problem becoming engineers effectively. So we're trying to make sure that high schools and even before then, uh, girls are having opportunities to learn and talk to people like me or talk to the female engineers who are on my team to get inspiration and to get resources so they can write code. I fully expect that when those, th when those programs become more mature that we'll be doing even more of them. But again, we're only quote unquote a five to six year old company. So this is kind of where we're starting right now. 
Um, hi, I have a question about uh, team forming. So um, it's very empowering, I guess, to to give teams uh, the power to define themselves and to hire. Uh, I was wondering if you let uh, the teams um, create their own teams, so sort of like uh, go down in trees, yeah, and just go as far as they want, or or is there some sort of limit? And uh, what kind of uh, problems arise from um, that independence that teams spawn other teams is basically what you're asking. So like generally I or one of my direct reports needs to sign off on when a team is needed because then we actually need to allocate headcount to it. We need to allocate the ability for that team to hire. Uh, Twitter manages the amount of people who work there very carefully uh, because it affects how much money we make and things like that. So I have to sign off or one of my directors has to sign off on the creation of a team before they run. The challenge though on, all, on having all these teams is normalization. Like I said that we allow anyone to branch out into whatever team they want to work on. So that means that every single team has to have the same quality bar. Every single team needs to be hiring just as awesome as a person as some other team will have hired. That's really the biggest challenge we have. So we, Twitter University literally runs classes on how to interview. Uh, and so we try to do that as a way to normalize across the board. So we, uh, the, the question is like, do we do want to some teams get too big and some teams get too small? It happens. Uh, and then when it happens, I have to have a conversation with that team to be like, hey, can you guys like spare someone so we can move it over to the group? And we try to figure out who would be the most interested person to do it. But we try to catch those before it happens. Um, so like teams can't hire as many people as they want. I'll tell a team you can hire one more person. So they have to go find that one more person. It's not like they can run off and hire seven people all of a sudden. Uh, hello, uh, can, uh, you cannot, uh, you already say that you spend a week in, in Tumo. Can you say your opinion about it? Of Tumo itself? Uh, sure, I mean, so this is my second trip to Yerevan. The first one didn't count because I literally only spent 22 hours in the country. Um, I was giving a talk here, I literally flew in one night and I flew out the next night, um, which sucks. It takes longer to get here than the amount of time I spent here. Um, but the talk, the talk I was giving was upstairs at Tumo. And what I took away from there is I, I've literally never seen a place like this anywhere in the world. Um, for better or for worse, I travel a lot. Uh, like Twitter sends me all these places I love to travel. Uh, I've literally never seen a place like Tumo anywhere in the world. So once I left here, I contacted Mary Lou, I contacted other people, and I was, I was desperately like, how can I help you? And so we've been talking ever since then of how, how I can be more engaged in this community, because again, I think it's unique. I think we're doing something here that we have an opportunity to basically change the direction of a country starting here. And I think this center is again one that doesn't exist anywhere else on this planet. Um, so you all should be really proud and feel fortunate that you're part of this community because again, take it from someone who's kind of been around the world a lot, this doesn't exist anywhere else. Oh, hi. Um, you thought that you allow teams to manage their budget uh, like for hiring people. Uh, what about the tools they use? Can they manage the budget for the tools? Or, um, uh, sorry, uh, do you have some uh, sh shared stuff for all of them? Thank you. So, so generally, we, we try to get every team to use the same tools. Um, it doesn't mean that teams can't experiment. Like I, I talked about the culture of experimentation. So if a team really feels strongly that their tools are better, or they can build better tools, they should try it. And if, they can, if it does end up being better, they should then pitch it to other teams, so other teams will use it. But generally, we try to get everyone to use the same tools, mainly because, especially for branching out, if people are bouncing between teams, I don't want them to have to learn a whole new tool set whenever they join the team. So I want them to join a new team and only really focus on the social dynamics and be like, and be like oh, this is familiar, I can write code here, and just hit the ground running, and not have to learn a whole new tool set in the process. 
So what tools do we use? General, so we have written our own build system. Um, it's called Pants, uh, like pants. Uh, it's on GitHub if ever, anyone wants to see it. We, do, we run our own build system because we have an, we, all our code is in one Git repository. Like literally all of Twitter is in one Git repository and it's massive. Like there are hundreds of different projects in this one Git repository. So Pants allows us to manage it a bit better. Uh, so we use that for build. We use a, a review board for reviews. We've thought about moving to like more of a, um, more of a, like a pull request model, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, so review board for reviews, Git for code. Uh, we use either Java or Scala for the, for the actual compilers in the back end. Um, and that's kind of it. We don't really mandate what IDEs you use and things like that. Uh, both Eclipse and something else which I'm blanking on are kind of supported. So then our build system can emit the right kind of uh, input files for those guys. Uh, but we don't really mandate it. Like for me, when I write code at Twitter, I just still use Emacs and the command line. So I'm fairly old school when it comes that way. Whereas some other people use full-fledged IDEs and things like that. Hi. Uh, thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, could you share also some stats on how many people were fired from Twitter, let's say in past two years? And uh, if it is an important process in regular team building process in the company? No, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how many people were, were let go, but I will say that it's non-zero. We do let people go from Twitter. And we feel it's important to actually do that because especially in the world that we're trying to keep the bar and engineering high, it's fairly demoralizing to really smart people when there are low performers in the organization. So me and my directs, we work very hard to make sure the bar is consistently high. If people aren't performing, we give them a shot. We are very open and honest with them and say, hey, you're not, you're not cutting it. These are the ways we think you can get better. And we give them a month or a month and a half to try to turn it around. And if not, then they've gotten the warning and then we'll ask them to leave. Thankfully, it doesn't happen that often. Our, our interview process is actually pretty good. So we try to bring the best in the world into Twitter and we keep that bar fairly high coming in. But it happens sometimes and we do have to take action on it. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've got another question uh, about the development process you're using at Twitter. For example, our company is using Agile Scrum and what are you using? So uh, I let my teams basically do whatever they want. Uh, I like to joke that we say we use Agile with a lowercase a. And by that I mean that I expect all teams to be working in two week sprints. I expect all teams to be doing planning at the beginning and, and a retrospective or a demo at the end. And I expect them all to use JIRA, so that's another tool for who is asking. JIRA for basically uh, tra tracking, tracking things that we should be working on. But besides that, do whatever you want. Some teams literally have stand-ups every single day. Some teams have it twice a day. Some teams only do it three times a week. It kind of depends on what the team really thinks is appropriate for the groups they have. One trick that we do like, though, is I have bought, like, do you see these screens that are hanging around Tumo? Every single team at Twitter has a screen of about that size that publicly shows the JIRA tickets they're working on right now. So as I walk the floor at Twitter, I can just look at all the screens and be like, oh, they're working on that. Great, they're working on that. Great. So it's just more like passive information about what every team is doing. I want every team to be proud of the work they're doing. So they shouldn't be embarrassed as on a screen next to them. And that sort of forces them to be proud about what goes up there. Uh, also, can you please tell the typical size of the team? It's like seven, ten people? Somewhere in the order of five to seven people. OK. Then the last question. Uh, you said that there is a problem with the hiring. You have to make sure that the bar for all the teams is the same. Yep. So how do you do that? People so, who are dedicated uh, recruiters? So uh, Twitter University runs a hiring class. So every team who wants to hire has to take the hiring class so they know how to hire at Twitter. And then we've actually run a bunch of different experiments. Uh, for a while, we only, we only allowed uh, very particular teams to hire for everyone in the company. So if you wanted to hire someone new, you had to talk to a team, they would hire for you. 
When we tried another model where we set what we called bar raisers, so if your team wanted to hire, you need to, in, you need to include someone else who's not on your team on your panel who has veto power over the hire. Uh, what we settled on today is basically a team hires, but you have to include three people or so from other teams onto your panel, but they don't have veto power, but their voice has to be heard as part of hiring. The thing that we normally do in the hiring panel, so like let's say you interview with Twitter, everyone who interviewed you is going to sit down and talk about you when you're done, when the interview is done. And what we basically do is ask everyone who interviewed you, would you work with this person and pair program with them for six months, let's say. If anyone says no, then it's going to be very hard for us to hire that person. Everyone has to basically say yes. So this means that we sometimes won't hire the smartest person in the world because they're a jerk. Um, so I'd much rather hire the second smartest person in the world that everyone on my team wants to work with instead. Thank you. Um, hello? I'm on the top. Hi. <laughs> well, first I want to say thank you for being here. Higher. Well, we're welcoming you here. Uh, now I lost you. Okay. So I have a question. How can we apply line? Deadline. All right. Oops. And uh, several levels maybe to go through to be hired. And um, maybe I missed in the beginning. I mean, I any, if you're asking how can you apply to work at Twitter effectively? Yes. Anyone can apply to work at Twitter. There's a website that's called jobs.twitter.com, and we take applications from people literally from anywhere in the world. We might do the first interview over Skype with you, uh, or we might do the first two interviews over Skype with you, and then if you pass those two interviews over Skype, we will put you on a plane to the headquarters, and we'll talk to you in person there. And then if that works out and we want to hire you, we'll offer to move you uh, to either one of the offices, or if you are so good, we let you stay wherever you are and be a remote engineer. We haven't really solved uh, single persons working from their houses. There are a few people who do that at Twitter, but especially since I have a strong philosophy of teams that's kind of against it. So you have to be excellent as an engineer for us to consider you working from home or working by yourself. And it's more likely we'd ask you to move to one of the offices around the world. But there are offices, at least for, for my team, there are offices in San Francisco, New York, Boston, Seattle, London, Dublin, and Tokyo. Uh, I would love to open more, but that's where my team is right now. And I'm so sorry, one more question. Um, do we need to have computer background? No, so we don't, as I said, I don't really look for people who are the best in the world at anything in particular. I look for people who are really, really smart. So there's a certain percentage of my team that doesn't have college degrees even. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't go to college. College is really important. Everyone go to college. Um, but I look for really smart people and with the ability to learn and have a technical mind. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. It sounds like you're really happy where you are at Twitter. And it sounds so fantastic, everything that you've said. Um, I, I just want to know what might be on the horizon both for Twitter and you. Is there a sneak peek at something that you can offer us or something to look out for? Yeah. I'm not going to leak any features right now, uh, but I will confirm I am pretty happy where I am. The thing that makes me sad about Twitter, frankly, um, is I haven't written code for Twitter in two months at this point. Uh, and every single day, that gets a little longer. Um, every once in a while, I try to write code, and one of my engineers says, no, like your code sucks these days. So that makes me sad. Uh, but besides that, I'm pretty happy at my job. Um, hi. Uh, thanks again for the great talk. I have two questions. I'm not, the first one is, I'm not going to ask you how to apply for a job, but I'm going to ask you how to apply for an internship, summer school, is there such a thing? Uh, so that's my question, if you can elaborate on that. And the second question is, um, last week, Turkey turned off Twitter. My question is, your thoughts on that? Does Twitter care? 
what do you do in these cases? I mean, Turkey is not the first nor the last country to uh, block Twitter. Um, if you can elaborate on that. I'll Thank take the you. easy one first. Uh, we have an excellent intern program. Like, I'm very proud of our intern program. I think platform engineering takes something like 30 interns a year, uh, 30 interns in the summer onto our team. And we take interns throughout the year. It's just a turn that for most universities, summertime is when they all show up. Um, so uh, as part of jobs.twitter.com, there's an application to be an intern at Twitter. We do the exact same thing. We do an interview with you. We fly you out for interview. We might not fly you out for interviews, but we'll do interviews over Skype. And if you're accepted, we'll pay for you to come to Twitter, uh, pay for you to fly to San Francisco or to one of the offices, and give you a stipend so you can afford a, uh, an apartment in San Francisco and stuff like that. You, you, turns out you don't have to worry about food because Twitter will just feed you. We just need to get you a place to sleep. And, and if you're even too lazy to figure out an apartment, we'll even arrange an apartment for you if you can get into the intern program. And so this happens year round. It just turns out the majority of the interns show up in the summertime. So I encourage anyone to apply. If you want, if you want to give a shot to get in, we'll have, we have a fairly rigorous coding exam for those who come in as interns. Um, but, but give it a shot. Uh, the bar is lower than regular engineers at Twitter. We're, because we are looking for people who are passionate about Twitter and that we as Twitter who are interested in teaching want to go and teach. So now you're asking about uh, Turkey and I'll phrase it this way instead. Twitter gets turned off by countries and by companies all the time around the world. Uh, China, for example, like I was in Shanghai just a few months ago, China has no access to Twitter anywhere except in Hong Kong. Turkey for a few, for a week or a few weeks had blocked Twitter access from that country. And I fully expect in other geopolitical situations like the ones that are happening right now in certain regions of the world nearby, that Twitter will be turned off in those situations as well, temporarily. Twitter's stance usually on these is it's not our fault. Uh, we do everything we possibly can to make sure Twitter is fully functioning and available but we'll also abide by local laws and local constructs. So for example, if you try to tweet about Nazi terminology in France, we will not censor your tweet, but we'll black out the tweet and we'll note next to it that this tweet is not allowed to be shown in France. Now you could change the language in your browser, you can do all these other things. So we'll do the best we can to preserve the voices of the users of the platform, but we do have to abide by local laws in the way we do it. So what happened in Turkey is that there was actually a, a court injunction that we actually got, went and protested the actions that they took against us, and that's why, partially why, the ban of Twitter was lifted there. There's nothing we can do in China, uh, but when it happens around the world, we just make it very loudly known that our system works just fine. Hi. Um, firstly, thank you for the talk and thank you for Twitter, Rep. Um, last, actually this event is kind of the result of your last visit in Armenia, as I, as I understood, to know if uh, you have, it's more of a suggestion rather than an idea, uh, question. I'd like to know if Armenia can kind of be involved in the global conversation of Twitter and if you have any plans if, besides the hashtag that you said that you are willing to work on that, but taking into account that Armenia is one word, it might be three words of English. So how do you see the trend, the users, the number of users in Armenia for Twitter, as you might have already known that we're not using it that often? I mean, so I'll say plans? that the, the, what we call the penetration number, basically the percentage of the population that uses Twitter in Armenia, is not as high as it is in other countries in the world. I don't even think it makes the, don't quote me on this, but I don't think it makes our top 25 list. Um, and I'm not so necessarily surprised because mostly that's mostly Western countries and Asian countries and things like that. Um, however, the language thing is actually fairly entertaining because I would say that the Japanese or the Chinese have the exact opposite problem where that one character can be a full word for them. Uh, they can actually put paragraphs in the tweet. So it's just sort of something that we have to work with across the board. It's not something that we're necessarily going to change on a case-by-case -case basis. So if we were to make that change, it would be across the board. Now, what, what can we do to serve better, um, better use Twitter in, in country? 
And I actually kind of leave that all up to you guys in some way. A lot of it is just pure engagement on the platform, whether it be getting newscasters to use it more and then having people retweet them or favorite them, whether it be getting your politicians to use it more. There's nothing Twitter has done per se in the US. I mean, I could take selfies with the president and that might help in some way. But there's not anything that Twitter has done in the US to get the politicians and things like that to use the platform. But instead, they find it useful to use because the population is using it. So the cycle is actually the opposite. When enough people start using it, then the politicians, the VITs, the celebrities and stuff like that also begin to use it because they find an audience there for themselves. I will say that, in my opinion, Twitter is a better platform than Facebook and other things like that in this case, but it just takes us to be using Twitter more and for, for, in order for that to happen. Hello? Oh, is it okay? Okay. We'll take some two or three questions and we are done, please. Hello. Uh, thank you for this special day. I have a question about verification. Why uh, Armenian famous people don't have verification? I mean that Armenians which live in Ar Armenia. So the way verification, I don't run verification, so that my information might be slightly out of date and I apologize if it is, but the reason we verify people is if there is a chance that there is a parody account of theirs that users might be confused who is the real person. So if that isn't a problem, then the verification team is usually not interested in investigating who, which one is the real, oh, like whether or not we should be verifying a particular person. So we look mostly at using verification as a way to prevent user confusion more than anything else. Hi, uh, my greetings to you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have uh, two questions. The first, I got uh, ASM that your database is MySQL. I am interested how you are keeping uh, huge data in that database. Uh, uh, please uh, describe uh, if you can uh, that uh, how uh, optimiz optimization steps are doing. And uh, the second question is about, are you keeping a version control uh, about history of data? So those are too long to answer here, but I can say two things quickly. One is we actually just recently published a blog post on engineering.twitter.com on what we've done with MySQL. Like we've joined what we call the web scale SQL initiative where, my, where Twitter, uh, Facebook and Google have joined forces with our own version of MySQL uh, because we felt that the MySQL community wasn't moving fast enough. So we basically have all our optimizations already in web scale SQL and that's what we're going to be pushing forward. And also we have our own storage mechanism that we call Manhattan inside the data center and there's an entire blog post on how Manhattan works. So that's what we've been using for data. The question is, the other question is do we version data? Very much so. I have complete history histories of everything that's happened on the platform. In fact, I was joking that we've never deleted anything at Twitter. So like ever since the platform turned on, I can go back and see all the logs from day one on the system and every single mutation that's happened across the way. So we can reconstruct, I mean, it'll be some work, but we can reconstruct how the data looked at any point. So last question. This is the last question, so I will have two. <laughs> uh, so the first one is about uh, managing. You mentioned. We cut you off. Yeah, somebody cut me. Uh, you mentioned that uh, your teams are self-organized and you don't want to interfere a lot. So uh, my question is: Do you have principal engineers and architects, and how we get involved in the development of uh, independent teams? And the second question, do you see like Twitter becoming more when uh, it is today, like becoming a protocol? I, I know many people say that it's the protocol of the Web 2.0 or, or 3.0, I don't know. What's your opinion about that? So Thank you. The question is, what do we do about principal engineers and architects? Generally, I hate the term architect, so we don't actually have architects on the, in Twitter. What we do have are principal engineers. Um, there are th currently three of them 
in all of Twitter. And then we have one level below that that we call the senior staff engineer. So there's about seven of those guys on all of platform engineering. And they're generally used as consultants. So whenever your team wants to go build a new system, my expectation is that you'd probably have asked like Peter or Kevin or one of those guys or Jeremy for their advice before you actually go and commit this code into production on whether or not the system is going to work the way you think it's going to work or Ari or someone like that. So generally those guys are floating around. They're usually working on a project and they're usually working on some of our biggest systems. So like Jeremy Cloud is our one of our principal, our senior staff engineer. He literally wrote the system that we call the tweet service. Like every single tweet goes through his code. Peter Schuler literally wrote Manhattan, which is what everything is stored on in Twitter. So he manages all the databases at Twitter. So these are some of the big guns of Twitter. So my expectation is if you're going to write a new system, you're going to talk to one of them. Um, do I check that you talk to them? No. But if your system fails in production and I find out you didn't talk to one of them, you'll be in trouble later. So it's one of those type of situations. Um, and then I forgot what was your second question. Oh, Twitter as a protocol? Eh. Generally, I think of Twitter as on one end of the Twitter pipe should be a person. So if it's person to person, that sounds great. If it's person to machine, that's probably fine. If it's machine to person, you know, my plants in my house tweet every once in a while but when they need water. So like that's fine. But we generally don't think of it as a machine to machine system, mainly because the SLAs are kind of weird. Uh, like, we operate on human time scales, meaning that when you send a tweet, it'll be delivered to someone's phone in like 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds because that's human reaction time. Uh, but if you're doing machine to machine stuff, then we need to probably go faster than that. And I just don't want to build that system right now. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Rafi, for really inspiring talk, uh, and I am sure after, after this lecture, a lot more people will join uh, Twitter community. And thanks to you for coming here today. Thank you.